Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming and welcome back to this talk in the series of webinar organized by ACE, South Africa, and the Spanish Embassy. Today, we have the pleasure to have Dr. Pachi Cervantes, an expert in statistical ecology. And uh, before uh, starting with Pachi, uh, let me share uh, with you a video recorded by Carlos Enrique Fernandez Arias, the, the Spanish ambassador in South Africa. Good afternoon and welcome to the FIP 2021 webinar organized by the Embassy of Spain in Pretoria together with the Society of Spanish Researchers in South Africa. Under the title Statistical Ecology, Hacking and Conservation of Ecological Systems, today's webinar is given by Dr. Francisco Cervantes, his doctoral fellowship between the South African National Biodiversity Institute and the Center of Statistics in Ecology, Environment and Conservation of the University of Cape Town. Dr. Cervantes will speak about the increasing interest in statistical ecology, a discipline at the interface between mathematics and biology, and will introduce us to the multidisciplinary effort to tackle pressing ecological problems such as climate change and the biodiversity crisis. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carlos Enrique. I have to add that uh, Pachi is particularly interested in crossing disciplinary boundaries to gain fresh perspectives over ecological systems and uh, in those applications that tackle human impacts on biodiversity. I wish you enjoy this talk and also uh, please, very important, uh, if you have any question, uh, remember to write them in, in the chat. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Pachi, uh, welcome. Thank you for, for being with us. Thanks, Mario. Um, yeah, and thanks everybody for, for coming. Um, and thanks to, to Ace and also the, the Spanish Embassy for, for inviting me. Um, let me share my screen. Can we see this? Okay. All right. So, um, okay. Let's, um, sorry. Um, let's start here. Okay. So, the other day I was, searching the web and um, I found myself uh, looking for um, stuff about hacking, uh, like computer hacking. Um, you know, when, when you start spending more time in front of the computer and you start getting um, interested in coding and software and this kind of thing, somehow um, you end up searching for this kind of, this kind of stuff. So, I was quite interested to see that there's actually some similarities between what hackers do and what we do in, in statistical ecology. Um, so I was curious and I Googled the definition of hacking in Google, and then you get this definition, which it's gain and authorized access to data in a system or computer. And so, yeah. Um, what we try to do in, in statistical ecology and in, in modeling in general is to um, understand some interest, interesting process, say A, um, through some observation process. So we set up in place some sort of method to observe the process of interest, and we gain some bits of information um, that are not nearly enough to understand what we want, or at least not, not directly. But through some thinking and some um, 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 
studying, we can come up with a model that um, uses those bits of information to recreate something that is similar to A. So we're somehow using uh, tiny bits of information that we get, some, some bits of data, and by putting those data into context and using some previous knowledge that we have of the system, we're actually able to access information that wasn't granted to us, right? And another interesting thing uh, that I found out is that not all hackers are, are um, criminals, obviously. Um, so that is something that apparently annoys hackers quite a bit because um, every time someone thinks of a hacker, thinks of this scary guy that wants to steal all your money and your passwords. But um, the majority of hackers are just professionals of security and they actually work towards increasing or improving security systems and are employed by companies to test their security systems. So these are called the, the, the black hack hackers, these are the scary people. And then you've got these white hack hacker, white hat hackers, which are just professionals, right? So we as ecologists, we obviously don't want to break into ecological systems and, and cause damage or havoc. We actually want to understand them better in order to be able to understand, um, to conserve them, sorry. Okay, so um, what is a statistical ecology? Um, I was searching the web of science in case somebody doesn't know what web of science is. It's one of the uh, main databases of scientific um, uh, publications. And I searched, I did three searches. I, I searched for um, uh, the word ecology. I searched for the word statistics in all the fields. And I searched for uh, statistics and ecology. And I also searched for the term statistical ecology as a concept, as one thing. And I've represented in this plot the results. So in the x-axis, we've got the years. So this is time. And then we've got the number of publications in the y-axis. And this is expressed as a percentage. It's a percentage of the total. And I took the percentage because you know, ecology might have uh, many more um, publications of statistics or vice versa, I don't know, but they can be in very different scales. And so they would, it would be different to, difficult to compare them. So this is percentages of total. There are several things we can, we can see here. Well, firstly, uh, we can see that scientific production is basically growing exponentially. And this is, this is a thing, it's an interesting thing. There's actually a few papers that, that look into that. And apparently they, they were, they were predicting that at some point this exponential trend was going to flatten out sort of like in a logistic type of way. And it seems it's, it's not doing that. It just keeps increasing exponentially. Anyway, that's um, this is the side uh, idea, which is quite interesting. And then what we can see is that both ecology and statistics grow more or less in parallel. And then we have statistics and ecology, so those publications that actually deal with both, they seem to um, grow a little bit uh, slower up until the 1990s or so, where it really picks up really quickly and suddenly uh, catches up with, uh, with, with the other two. I haven't done any statistical analysis on these trends, and so they might be spurious, but um, I thought it was interesting to see. Um, what is clear from this picture, in the background, we've got the statistical ecology. I used bars for this because there are um, much fewer publications that actually have the term statistical ecology in them. And so uh, it is a lot more wiggly than the other, the other lines. And what is clear from this plot is that before the 1970s, there's no publications basically that deal with this term. And we've got a few uh, in the in the 70s and beginning of the 80s, and then it is in the 90s when this um, term is a bit more prevalent and it seems like um, it is here to stay. Um, 
we've got this same exponential growth as for the other disciplines. And this is a good thing because, um, well, let's be honest, ecologists are not very keen to learn statistics in general or haven't been traditionally um, because we typically like to work outside and we probably want to study our favorite species or whatever and we want to work for um, conservation of these species and we think that possibly being in front of the computer for many hours doesn't really solve any any problems but it's not really like that so if we if we gain some insights into statistics and mathematics uh, and we're able to frame our questions in a numerical or quantitative way um, we usually are able to have a more much more clear picture of what the different elements of the problems are, how they relate to each other, and therefore we're able to design our studies better, we're able to design our survey methods better, more efficiently. Um, we might not spend a lot of money in, in measuring things that are, might not be that important. And once we've collected our data, we're able to extract information from um, in, in a rich way. So we're able to build complex models that um, can accommodate different structures and more richness in, um, in the information. And then once we've got our, our ecological data and our analysis, uh, we have a clear picture of what is important and what is not. And then we can develop evidence-based solution to our, to our problem. Um, and I think ecologists are embracing these ideas a little bit more, and you see more and more interest in, in, in all these analytical methods. So what, what kind of problems are we talking about? Um, in, in ecology, we've got very big problems, like, for example, climate change and biodiversity loss, which are probably the, the biggest or the most popular uh, problems that we, we hear about, but these problems are really very complex. Uh, they've got many pieces that interact with each other in, in complicated ways. And so we can't just tackle these um, um, directly. We need to um, understand different aspects of the ecology of, or, or, or different aspects of ecological systems to be able to uh, put the pieces together and try to tackle the big ones, uh, the big problems. Um, so, for example, we might want to know, we might want to understand um, the population dynamics of the different species and how many uh, individuals there are, so their abundance. We might want to understand what is the distribution of those species, geographical distribution. We might um, want to know how they move around and how they uh, disperse, changing their distribution, and also how they interact with, with each other, different species. And there are many others, obviously. These are probably the ones that I'm more familiar with, but obviously there are many others. We've seen also um, studying these complicated and complex big, big problems, um, We've, we've developed new ways of capturing data. So uh, an example of this, for example, is the, um, the development of telemetry methods. So back in the, in the 1990s, 1980s, most of the transmitters that we put in, the, in, in our animals uh, emit radio signals. And we needed technicians going out in the mountain with antennas to actually capture those signals. And it was a very costly exercise and um, it, it was slow and the data wasn't really great. So we could only uh, hope for maybe uh, studying the rough home range of the species. But nowadays, with, with new transmitters, uh, this is a Viroxus eagle, which is a, a species that occurs in, in Southern Africa. Um, um, and this is equipped with a high resolution 
transmitter. This is actually a bit, it can be a bit smaller. Uh, it just has this um, ba base plate here. But anyway, um, this is our solar panel and it's able to um, connect with satellites. So it emits a satellite signal uh, every few seconds. Um, this both photos are courtesy of uh, Dr. Megan Morgotrite, which is a colleague of mine. And in the picture here on the, on the right, you can see one of the trajectories of this bird um, uh, captured with a very high resolution. So each of these uh, points is uh, location of the bird. And we can see how it soars up. Um, and then when it reaches the top, it glides down towards the next slope in a very, really uh, uh, well-defined, say, trajectory. Um, this is all great, but uh, analyze this type of data actually requires us to use more sophisticated methods because there are some structure in the data that is not captured by the regular models that we used to use back in the day, which, you know, um, uh, assume that our data points are independent from each other and that kind of thing. If we capture points very close in time, those points are going to be uh, related. So the bird can't teleport to somewhere in the world in, in, in a few seconds. It's going to be just around the previous location. So that is for an example of some structure that our models have to contain. Some other data capture methods are uh, camera traps. So we see in the picture here on the left, this is a, a camera and this is just like a LED, like an infrared um, LED light. And this is the actual camera and these are motion detectors. So when an animal crosses the motion detectors, it triggers the camera and, and the camera takes a photo. Um, a, a, another, for example, a similar uh, thing is uh, acoustic arrays. So we can we can use instead of camera traps that capture images, we can use uh, microphones that capture uh, sound. These two photos are courtesy of um, Professor Rest Albert, which is my principal investigator in my in my current project, and. They set up a, an array of microphones to try and quantify the abundance of these little tiny guys. These little frogs are super difficult to find. They live in Table Mountain. And so it's, it's basically impossible to count them, obviously. So, and it is very difficult also when they, when they chirp, when they sing, it's very difficult to locate where they are. And basically almost impossible to actually figure out how many they're actually uh, singing or chirping. Uh, so what we do or what they did was to set up, set up an array of microphones. And by looking at the time delay of the sound signal between the different microphones, you can actually uh, work out the distance of the frog to each of the microphones. And you can pinpoint what it is. And you can do that with the different, with all the frogs and you can try and estimate the abundance of them. It is a similar con uh, con uh, concept that you can do with, with camera traps. So if you, you would expect that those camera traps that are, for example, imagine that we are working with a leopard. If um, those camera traps are close to the center of activity of this animal, you're going to get a lot of photos of, uh, of that animal in those cameras. Whereas if the camera is far away from the center of activity, uh, you're gonna get less, less images. And so working out um, the relationship between the distance to the, to the activity center and the number of photos, we can work out more or less where that activity center is, and we can try and estimate how many leopards, for example, we have. Another field or another data capture method that's seen a lot of development recently is uh, citizen science-based uh, methods. So 
we've got several apps like iNaturalist or Bird Laser that makes it really easy for anyone that's not professional ecologist or is not affiliated necessarily to an institution to just go out and um, collect data about a presence of certain species somewhere, just as they go about, they go about their business. Um, there's usually, well, programs, uh, you know, these science, citizen science programs usually have some institution, scientific institution coordinating the, the program and designing the surveys. And you usually have a minimal protocol that you have to follow. But in general, it uses a lot of people that are voluntary people. They, are, they don't get paid and you get huge amounts of data. They cover uh, really vast, um, areas and so it, it, it's got a lot of potential and um, in South Africa we've got the the save up two which is the South Southern African bird atlas project which um, tries to study the distribution of the different bird species in in Southern Africa and we've got uh, coordinated water counts which uh, aims at estimating the abundance of the different water bird species. And we will hear a little bit more about these two. And there are other programs like the Virtual Museum, uh, which uses iNaturalist. So people take pictures of some uh, species that they've seen somewhere and they send it to the Virtual Museum. And there is a curator there that looks at the pictures, makes sure that the record is accurate. And if it is, then um, that picture can uh, is get published uh, in the in the museum, and uh, some people might actually be contributed to citizen science even without knowing it. Because, for example, there was a paper in twenty nineteen, I think, that used um, Google Images to study the diet of the Marshall Eagles. So they just looked for different pictures where the Marshall Eagles actually are, can, can be observed eating something. And with those pictures, they, uh, well, they analyzed those pictures to learn about the, the eating habits, uh, the feeding habits of these species. I think they could uh, use something like less than 10% of the images that they got from, from uh, Google Images for different reasons, but they still got a decent number of, of pictures, something like 200 or something. So uh, it's, it's got potential. And forgive me if I'm uh, giving the, the wrong numbers, but you get the idea. Okay, so with these, Data capture methods, as, as we as, as we've uh, said, there is there are different observation processes. So that these different observation or data capture methods in, include or introduce st different structures in our data, and we'll see examples just now. So you might have temporal structures like we saw with the with the trajectory of the eagle. Data is not independent. You might have spatial structures uh, because um, uh, data is captured close in space, not just in time. And so we need models that describe all these observation processes. We sometimes want to learn about an observed state. And what is that? Like, for example, we might be interested in knowing about what is the behavior of, of our animal. So whether it is eating, or it is uh, just moving in a linear way, or what is it doing? And we, we can't observe that state. It's something that's not observable. But we can observe locations. And we can study patterns in the locations that are provided by the GPS uh, tags, for example, to try and infer those unobserved states. And we have to also uh, deal with measurement error. And perhaps these are four key points that, um, that are common in, in current statistical methods. So let's see a couple of examples that I've been busy with in the last couple of years to make this a bit more concrete. So 
Last year, we were trying to estimate the utilization distribution of the Cape Vulture. The utilization distribution is um, it's not just, just the geographical distribution of where the species occurs, but it is also uh, the distribution of intensity of use. So what areas are used more intensively and which areas are used less intensively. So vultures are, are uh, suffering really extreme declines everywhere. And it, it, this is quite a, quite a problem because they provide very important uh, services to uh, ecological services, uh, to us and to other species, to ecosystems in general. So they get rid of carcasses, they reduce uh, the transmission of diseases, and they also regulate uh, the population of other species, like for example, feral dogs, which in absence of vultures can feed on, on these carcasses and they can get very prolific and they cause problems with, with other species and also for humans. <clears throat> Unfortunately, human infrastructure uh, very often poses threat to these species, like they, for example, get electrocuted in power lines, they um, hit uh, the, the blades of the wind turbines uh, and they get killed. So, um, there is a very rapid development of wind energy here in South Africa and, and, and the preferred areas for, for development very often overlap with the distribution of the, of the Cape Watch, which is an endangered species. And it occurs mostly in South Africa, although sometimes there's some populations that occur around um, around South Africa, like in South Botswana and also in, in Zimbabwe, uh, well, a little bit in Namibia and Mozambique as well, you know, in, in all the countries around uh, South Africa, but possibly 90% of the, of the population occurs in South, South Africa and South Botswana. So what, do, what we did was to collect telemetry data that has been collected by other organizations, collaborator, um, collaborator organizations, the organizations that are collaborating with us in this study for different reasons. So it, the data was not specifically collected for these, it was collected for many other things like studying um, dispersion of the species or like um, uh, feeding habits, uh, many other things. So, and, and this data was collected since 2004 uh, up until now, not necessarily covering the full period, all the vultures. So some vultures were captured back in the day and they're not emitting anymore. And some vultures are currently emitting still. And um, in the panel here on the, on the left, we see the, the distribution of locations in a 50 by 50 grid cell, 50 by 50 kilometers. So each of these squares is 50 by 50 kilometers. And this is in a log scale, just because some, some of these cells accumulate a lot of locations. And if I presented it in a linear scale, uh, those cells would completely um, destroy all the structure in the other ones. But it's not important. The important thing is that darker cells have a higher number of, of locations uh, that, that were collected from these tagged vultures. And here on the left, we have uh, the colonies. So these, these species is gregarious. They tend to aggregate around colonies, which are usually in cliffs. And, and they go about their things uh, around their colonies. Usually they can change colonies sometimes, especially juvenile birds, non-adults, but um, in general, they stay around their own colony. So one might be tempted to just go ahead and say, okay, look, you know, if I've got more locations in these darker places, then those are the important ones. But um, this is actually the observation process playing tricks on us because uh, we just have a sample of 70 vultures. I should have said that. Uh, we, we can't observe the whole population. And, and this was, uh, as we said, the sampling wasn't designed for being representative of the, of the whole population. 
it was designed for different purposes. So there was a study here in Namibia that was looking for something. There was another study here that was looking for another thing. And it turns out that um, we've got uh, something like seven or eight birds that come from Namibia. But the Namibian population is tiny. Actually, right now, it's almost extinct. So um, what we need to do is we need to learn about the habits like habitat selection and movement characteristic of the species looking at these birds. But then we need to extrapolate to all those other colonies and all those other birds that we don't know anything about. So how do we go about that? What we do is we, we, we do what we call the resource selection. So we compare, basically we compare those uh, locations that we've observed with some background location. So in the picture here, we've got elevation in the background, but it could be anything. And it could actually be a combination of different habitat features. And, and what we want to do is we want to compare the locations that were actually used, so these green locations, with those that weren't used, okay, and were available for the birds, which are these purple pink locations. Um, but again, there is a catch. Um, if we look at the mobility of the birds, and we look, look at the panel here on the left, we see that the step length, which is the, the distance between two consecutive uh, telemetry locations, is usually small. And we've got some of them that are larger, but they're mostly small. What that means is that if we observe a location here where this green cross is, uh, it is uh, very likely that we're going to observe the next location around here. So the availability of the bird, if we consider its mobility, is, is not the whole range that we were considering before. So if we want to compare used versus available, we just have to take the available sample according to this distribution over here. So that's another example of how um, the um, knowledge about the system and the observation process or well the knowledge about the system can help us filter out a little bit that observation process or understand the observation process a little bit better <clears throat> if we did the same with all the um, with all the locations then our sample is actually something like this is it is not like we saw at the beginning so that can change the analysis quite a bit because, for example, this very high elevation was never available for the bird. Whereas if we use that naive approach, we would probably conclude that the bird likes to be uh, here in, the, in, lower, uh, in lower elevations. And we can, we can do the opposite. So once we know the, the habitat preferences of these birds and we know how it moves, then we can go the other way around. We can simulate data. Uh, we can simulate steps. And we can simulate many, 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 many steps. And we can count how many uh, locations we get in each of the, of the pixels. And then we get the distribution that can look something like this. Um, we've called this hazard. Don't worry about it. It's more. It, so what this represents is the probability of finding the vulture. Um, in an area that is enclosed by the colors. So in an area that is enclosed by this um, outside color, um, it is 100%, it is, it is one. Uh, to see it inside this other one would be 0 0.75 and so on and so on. And this is our utilization distribution. This is what we would want to uh, know to try and and not put wind turbines in areas that are heavily used by the watches. Um, we complicated this a little bit more. I'm not going to go into this because we don't have much time. But uh, basically, you can scale uh, this distribution by the size of the colony. You don't have to just um, calculate it for one vulture. The other uh, project that I wanted to talk about is the biodiversity data pipeline for wetlands and water birds. This is the, 
project that I'm currently working on. And um, we are trying to develop a web application, basically like a web portal in which we will present some indicators that will be useful for conserving wetlands and waterfalls. Wetlands are very important ecosystems. They're very productive and they're very diverse. And it happens that humans like to build their cities and their things next to water, right? And so the wetlands are probably the first ecosystems that are actually impacted by our uh, activities. And at the same time are probably one of the most important uh, ecosystems for us. So we really need to understand these, um, these systems well, and we need to find uh, evidence-driven, uh, we need to implement evidence-driven conservation policies quickly. So the idea here is that, uh, this is also a very big collaboration project. Um, the idea here is to bring in citizen science data into the pipeline. And uh, this, this data uh, will be clean and validated. And then we will implement some like automated statistical routines that will output some information that can be interpreted and presented to decision makers so that they don't have to go through all the process of of analyzing this and, and uh, they can act quickly. Um, as you can see, there are many different um, organizations here in the different, in the different pieces. The, the main statistical analysis happens within this yellow square. So we're going to be using QUAC, uh, those uh, coordinated water count, uh, water bird counts, um, which will give us a species abundance or how many of the species, how many individuals the species has and how the abundance change over time. And then we will analyze that using state-based models and I'll explain that what that is. And then we're going to be using also the, the Southern African Bird Atlas project data, which um, is it doesn't give you abundance, it gives you presence or absence of or detection and not detection of species in a grid of pentads. Pentads, I think, is like a five minute by five minute uh, grid in a map. And this is useful for investigating distribution of species and it's analyzed using occupancy models. And state space models. You have a, a process of interest. We love to put Greek letters here to torture people, but it's really not very important. So you, you, you have a, a process of interest, which in this case will be bird abundance. So bird abundance, mu, at time t, will be um, related to you know, bird abundance at t minus one and, uh, and some rate. So the abundance at T minus one times some rate or plus some rate will be, uh, will give us our abundance of time T and so on. So abundance change over time. We don't typically get to see all the birds. So we don't get to count or every bird. We just get to see some of them, which are represented by this Y. This is our data. Um, obviously, the amount of birds that we count is related to the number of birds that were present, we hope, um, but, but there will be some error associated with it, which is represented by this sigma. So this is the, the normal structure of a state space model in a discrete time. This can also happen in continuous time, but it doesn't really matter. For the purpose of illustration, this is what we see. And an interesting feature of these models is that the observations are not connected to each other. You see, uh, they're only connected directly. They are connected to each other through the, uh, this unobserved process. Um, this is what allows us to actually 
uh, disentangle or separate the two processes, the unobserved process that we just seen from the process that we observe uh, there are the counts. Don't worry about it. This is just a complicated model that we use. So that this is the base model. This is just to show you that our model is a little bit more complicated. We've got more states. We've got like a summer um, um, population size. We've got a winter population size that are related to some other stuff. So it's a bit more complicated than that, but that is the idea. And this is what we more or less what we get. So we get evolution over time of the log of abundance. Sorry for working with a log scale over time, uh, but it's just easier to do. And we've got the evolution of the summer population. We've got the evolution of the winter population. We've got the evolution of the, of the growth rate. And we also get the proportion of winter to summer population. This is the kind of thing that we're going to present in our in our portal, in our uh, tool. Occupancy models are a different type of model. It de it all, they also deal with, with detection and observation process. This is um, a very nice picture uh, that is extracted from a paper in echography that um, was published by Guru Cheta Guillera Ritia. And it depicts very well how these, these processes and these models work. So you have some ecological process down here that conditions the distribution of bunnies. Okay, so we've got these bunnies here and we've got some observer that wants to detect the bunnies. But um, uh, he, he, visits, he visits several squares and in the, in the um, top layer here, we see whether he observes the bunny with, and, and he gets a one or he doesn't observe it and he gets a zero. So we see that sometimes he misses the, the bunny that's present, sometimes he does. So we have an observed pattern and we've got an occupancy pattern. And then we've got some observation process that connects the two. Occupancy models try to understand the distribution of bunnies down here uh, by looking at the observed pattern at the top. So this is the distribution of the little grebe, which is a aquatic a water bird. It's quite common. I think it is in 2019. And we can see the different elements of the occupancy model. So we've got occupancy probabilities that are just related to habitat characteristics of the um, of the pentads of the of the grids. And we've got the detection probability in a particular year that's going to be given by some uh, variables that are particular to the pentads, but also of whether the pentad was visited and how many times. So we can see these yellow pentads here were probably visited many times. This is Johannesburg. So um, we can see that we've got a, a very defined observation process here in which you know, uh, areas that are close to people are more likely to be visited. And therefore, species there are more likely to be detected should they be present. And then we've got eventually the realized occupancy. This is the probability that the, present, the species was present in each of these places, given that people were looking for them, they went to the, to the pentads, and given the occupancy probability. So these very bright yellow are those pentads where the species was actually detected. So we are certain that the species was there and they get a probability of one. In other pentads, uh, we're not that sure. And then we have to go with the modeled probability that is going to be there. And so this is going to be very important to give, um, you know, we, we need to report to certain um, con conventions and treaties internationally and nationally, in which, you know, for example, we have to um, uh, detect those sites or so wetlands that regularly support 
20,000 or more water beds. This is um, according to the Convention of Wetlands of International Importance, Ramsar, which was signed in 1971, I think or sites that regularly support 1% or more of individuals of a population of a species. So with the tools that I just showed you, we expect or we uh, hope that we can obtain this kind of information. And so we can um, identify those sites that are more important for water beds. And similarly, at a national level, we have to uh, investigate the threat status of a species. So what is the rate of the population, uh, rate of change of the population? What is the area of occupancy and how they change over time? Um, if we can you know, get this information in real time, it will be really great. And then we can obtain other metrics such as you know, uh, what percentage of the population lives within protected areas to understand whether we're protecting this species properly. And well, we've just scratched the surface of, uh, of what all this is about. Um, next year, we are hosting the International Statistical Ecology Conference here in Cape Town. It is a reference worldwide, and it's usually a great conference. So if anybody is interested in, in this discipline, I would encourage everybody to keep an eye on, on um, our website, www.isec2022.org, and um, the Twitter account, which is at isec.eco. It will be a mixture of uh, in-person and online. So if you can get safely to Cape Town, I would encourage you to do that because it's a great city. But if you can't, then there's no excuses because you can still attend these online. And that's all from my side. I just want to show you a lot of people that is involved in these projects. There's just two projects and all these people were there. And um, just want to give a big thank you to all of them. This is usually uh, really a collective effort. And that's all. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Thank you so much, Tachi. And now uh, questions are very welcomed. So please use the use the chat. Well, I I have some questions. Uh, I'm really interested in in, in citizen science. Uh, I'm quite fond on I, I naturalist. Um, well, uh, th this this year, for example, we've we've organized in Spa in Spain the the first bio blitz of of Spanish flora, which was uh, really successful with more, uh, more than one thousand people uh, participating and many 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 observations. So I see what you say about the the great potential of, of of citizen science, mm -hmm. and um, we we really have a a, a problem this, and and you can be a a great a great link. Um, okay, we were uh, we've been wondering for a long time how to connect this uh, citizen science data with statistical analysis, as you said. Um, especially inspired for South African uh, Zambi because they have, um, in, in, in this case, my, my area is related with, with plants, but I, 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 I've, I'm really interested in biodiversity in general. But in Zambi, they, they perform in South Africa the, the red list of South African plants, and they have right. linked it with citizen science. Mm -hmm. So, what they are doing is that when, when uh, citizens provide data, the red lists are um, they are uh, 
frequently updated because of this new data. Yeah. So, um, well, I'm very interested in, um, we are very interested in performing this here and, and we've been talking with uh, South Africa and people for this, but uh, I'm asking you, uh, in, your, in your case, and especially because bu uh, vultures are, uh, I think, six or seven species of vultures in South, in South Africa, they are really, really in danger and suffering a, a great decline, uh, as you said. That's right, yeah. Do you think that um, we have citizen uh, science data to perform something like, like this and to perform maybe demographic models to detect declines or we not have enough data for the moment see, because they, uh, we need data for more years? And besides of this, do you think it's uh, feasible, is, is possible to export this citizen science data, or I think you are doing it, mm -hmm. to use them with ecological models? Do you, do you think this yeah. is easy, difficult? No. Or? no, definitely, definitely. I mean, um, we are doing it, so it, it is definitely possible. And there, there are uh, something. So, for example, we've got um, the the Quack uh, project allows us to study the evolution of populations much more easily because we obtain measures of abundance. We obtain counts, so we just have to try and filter out the measurement error and some other stuff. But we are working with counts. In the case of the South African atlas, the South African bird atlas, uh, we get detection and non-detection. Now, even with that type of data, there are models that actually link the probability or the reporting rates, let's say, how many times the species has have been recorded in a specific pentad. It links it to the number of birds or the number of individuals, it can be plants or whatever. So, so the idea there is the more, the more individuals you have present, the more likely it is for people to actually observe them. And so there is a, there is a link between the, the reporting rate and the number of, of individuals. So if you have some other information that you can complement that with, uh, you can try and, and work out the, the evolution of the, of the abundance of the population. We've actually done that for another species, for the Black Harrier. Um, and we've conducted like a population viability analysis by just looking at um, detection, non-detection data. And, and yeah, so I, I, I'm working with Sambi. On, on this, on the data pipeline. And I know they, they assess several, like a selection at least of, of plant species every year for, for the red listing and all that, um, that kind of thing. So if you're interested, I can definitely put you in contact with uh, people who's doing that. And if you need, um, uh, yeah, uh, more ideas about how to maybe analyze uh, that data, uh, definitely get in touch with us. It would be interesting to uh, see what uh, data exactly you're working with and, and see how, what we can do. Okay. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> well, um, I, see, I see no questions in the chat. I think I'm doing it correctly. Um, otherwise, I can ask you another, another question, um, which would be um, how, how accurate, uh, how do you trust in the citizens uh, science data? Do they have any, uh, any check or are there people uh, checking them and confirming that these data are correct maybe for, uh, I, I know I naturalists use photographs, but 
I don't know, sounds, photographs. Do, do, yes. Are there people doing this or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, so in case of um, SABAP and, and Quack, it is the Fitzpatrick Institute that coordinates the program. And um, there, there is usually, I'm not exactly entirely sure what the procedure is, but I know that they do have a, a validation procedure in place. So if a species is completely out of range, uh, something like a strange, really strange appearance, I know they actually contact you and say, are you sure about that? Do you have a photo or something? And, and if you don't, I don't think that will be um, admitted. Uh, but uh, with, with more common things, I know the, the data does go through, through some preliminary filtering process. Um, and I know that in the uh, virtual museum, they also have people that actually look at the, at the photos and the location, and they try to validate uh, a little bit the, the identification and that kind of thing. Yeah. And we hope that also through all the statistical analysis, you would get, I mean, if you misidentify a species, then there's nothing you can do with statistics, obviously. But if you don't count the species correctly, or the, the number of individuals and that kind of thing, you can use uh, the, the evolution of the, of the counts in previous years and in, in, in uh, posterior years to actually calibrate a little bit the, the error that you could expect. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pachi. And my last question before finishing is that do you do you miss going outside to the field as an eco ecologist? I, I miss do. it a lot. I also <laughs> have a lot of computer work. Yes, no, I definitely do. Uh, Especially I used to in South be Africa. Able... Yeah, definitely. No, I used to be able to, to do both. Um, but in the last five years or so i've had very little field work but um yeah yeah i definitely miss it but okay like, great you know, that is what uh, we have to do now um i also love uh, being here so uh, you know if, if you can do both i think it's the is the best yeah. okay so it's been a, a great seminar, very, very interesting topic. Uh, congratulations, Pachi. So uh, I think there are no more questions. So we are going to, to finish the, the, webin the webinar of today. Thank you again to the South African Embassy and to ACE South Africa. So uh, I hope to, to see you very soon in, in the next uh, seminar. Uh, goodbye. Thank you, Patsy. Thank you, Mario. And thanks, everyone, for coming.